Hello, my next guest today is Dr. Kevin Ashley, expert on in information technology and director of the Digital Curation Center in the United Kingdom, an institution providing expertise in digital information curation and research da data management. Uh, welcome, Dr. Ashley, and thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And thank you for, for the opportunity to, to, to talk. Uh, open data seems to be a natural follow-up of open access. However, we cannot read complex data sets as easily as we can read scholarly papers. What has to be done to make uh, data effectively reusable? So I'll, I'll deal with that question in two parts because uh, I begin by saying I'm not sure that open data is the simple follow-on to open access. From a policy point of view, that is how we've seen the changes uh, occur, I think certainly throughout the Western world, but looking back, uh, my career began in medical research um, more years ago now than, than I like to think of, and reuse of data was common in many scientific disciplines then. In fact, we, we can trace the history of organizations like CoData, which are all about data reuse. They go back more than 50 years, and the open data repositories that existed uh, then were creating a culture of data reuse in some s disciplines, not, not very many, admittedly, that predates any ideas of, of open access as, a, as an end worth pursuing. But then scholarly publishing was also very different 50 years ago, and, and perhaps the concerns we have now aren't, aren't there. So I think these things have, have, have come together, but they've, they've, they've come from, from, from different areas. And in terms of whether data is easier to read than a paper, that also depends on your starting point. Um, I find some data easier to make sense of than, than some scholarly papers, for instance. Not all scientists are very good about writing about their research. They may be very good at doing it, but they're not good at explaining it to another audience. And that's why we have people who specialize in, in the communication of science, whose job it is to do that, to make research comprehensible and accessible to those who aren't specialists in a, in a, in a particular field. But I accept in general, yes, it's true. We, we, papers are meant to be written in human readable language, therefore we ought to be able to understand them, uh, and data generally isn't. Uh, so it needs additional material, documentation, support to help us understand something about it. So that's something as simple as uh, documenting particular variables and saying, you know, what type of number is this? How precise is the measurement uh, that I've taken? Uh, how can we, if any techniques have been applied to clean up these measurements, what were they? Because perhaps I don't like your techniques and perhaps I need to, to undo them and to apply a different technique. Um, documenting data as a whole and, and saying, how do we make these measurements? If it was, a, let's say, a survey of people, how do we choose the set of people that, that we looked at? Lots and lots of, of things that become, each of which becomes more or less important depending what the discipline is and depending what the type of data is. And yes, those are things you don't need to do with papers. You don't need to write that, that, that set of um, explanations around the paper to help you understand it in, 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 the, same, in the same way. And to make open data really usable, it's important that you've got those, those supports, the, the, the additional documentation, as well as the means to discover it. It's not enough that I'm willing to give you my data if you have no way of finding out that my data exists. So you've got to be able to find that. You've got to uh, ideally also have a means of accessing it that doesn't depend on me, because I won't always be here. Even when I am here, I don't always answer my email. You know, there are lots of reasons why it's, it's helpful to have data repositories whose job is to make, uh, in the words of a standard that we use, uh, OAIS, independently reusable. That means reusable without having to go back to the creator of the data and ask them questions or ask them permission. Uh, that's helpful, I think, for many researchers. It's frightening for some of them to give up that control. But it's also helpful if you have a very popular data set you don't want to spend your life dealing with all these people saying, please explain how I make sense of this. Please uh, let me know if I can use the data in this way. Because a repository does that job for you. They act as a, 
an intermediary between you and the people who want to reuse the data? Research data management may seem relatively easy when we think about one institution or one discipline, mm -hmm. but it becomes quite a tough task when we adapt a broader perspective or of interdisciplinary, multi-formatted, heterogeneous data mm -hmm. uh, processed on a global scale. And uh, I would like to ask you, how can data be successfully collected, uh, stored, retrieved? How can we manage data? successfully and efficiently? I'd love to be able to give you an absolutely certain answer to that, but I can't. I think it's, it's true that we're, I think, still experimenting with a move from highly discipline-specific data management and data reuse to that global interdisciplinary infrastructure that you refer to in your question. And I don't think we yet understand all of the barriers that will be in our way in doing that. Uh, I do know that it's certainly the principle in the, in the United Kingdom where I'm based and, and I think in a number of other countries as well that where good working domain specific infrastructures exist we should use them. We, we're not trying to say that a generic global infrastructure or one that, that, that's, that's federated based on, on let's say to university data repositories. We're not saying that should replace what some scientific domains have done. The push for infrastructure at every level from specific universities up to things like Zenodo at CERN that's trying to provide a global discipline agnostic solution, that, that push comes from the fact that there are far more scientific disciplines that do not have repository infrastructure than do. The ones that do are doing very well with, with reuse. The ones that don't, we know that are researchers in many disciplines who've, who realize the potential for their, the reuse of their data and they have no one to give it to. And, and that's a real problem for them. And we know that we've lost lots of data in the past because of that. People at the end of their career, desperate to hand their data on to someone and they can't find any willing custodian. So getting universities as a start to accept that it's their responsibility to take that data that has no other home and make it available is, 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 is a good first step. It's probably not as reusable as the data in the domain repositories. It's probably not as discoverable. But at least it has been preserved. It hasn't been lost. And the potential for reuse uh, exists. And I don't think it matters too much if we have you know, some data that, that, that's highly curated and highly reusable and some other pieces of data that are not as reusable. It, it, it makes it easy to bring everything up to, to, to the right level if, if, we, if we capture it all in some way. I mean, I think the Tim Ernest Lean has, has, has alluded to this in talking about open data in a more general sense on the web. They have this concept of five-star open data. And, and to get the first star, your data just has to be there on the web. It might be in a proprietary format, it might not be well described, it might be really difficult to use, but at least it's there. And you move up in all the levels by using non-proprietary formats, by having it well described so that it's discoverable, and finally by having it linked to all the other data sets that it might. That's perfection in many ways, and we don't have that with most research data. We don't have data sets which contain links to other data sets to say, you know, th this variable here relates to these other experiments, these other measurements. That that's something that we're all aiming towards. But we get to that final step by taking the first step of simply capturing it, preserving it, uh, and, and giving it some permanent home and permanent identity that at least somebody else can use to cite it. I, mean, I often use the, the analogy with uh, the more traditional materials that, that university libraries have. Um, now, any old university is full of documents written in ancient languages that most of us don't read anymore. And that's not accessible to someone like me. I don't speak ancient Greek or Latin or Sumerian or any of these other languages. But that doesn't mean I don't think they should keep these documents. You know, just say, oh, I didn't translate them all. You know, otherwise it's useless. No use to me. I can't make any sense of that. But there are people who can make sense of it. And they're willing to invest the extra effort to understand these old documents because of the value that it's going to bring. And in the same way, we invest effort in accessing some badly described data because we know there's value buried in it. 
Dr. Ashley, let's talk for a while uh, about uh, your institution, the mm -hmm. Digital Curation Center. What are the major areas in which uh, you're actively participating? What are your key objectives? So there are a number of different questions uh, there. So the areas of activity and, and, and the objectives we have are dictated to a great extent by, by the streams of funding that, that support us. And most of our money comes from UK higher education and it's meant to benefit uh, the, the UK. Uh, so that means our main focus is on helping every research institution in the UK increase its own ability to take care of the data that it's responsible for and to help its researchers reuse the data that, that's elsewhere. But inevitably, you know, th this is an international activity. And if we were to say this is only a UK problem and we only speak to people in the UK, we wouldn't really be solving a problem that, that, that's global. So our activities split to some extent between things that are focused very specifically on, on institutions and researchers in the UK and activities through more global link-ups like the Research Data Alliance with organisations like CoData where we, on problems that are truly worldwide, we work with similar organisations to share the responsibility for doing some of these things. And in some cases we'll, we'll take something that we've developed ourselves, uh, for instance we produced uh, a, an attempt to catalogue all the different research metadata standards that exist, formal standards for documenting and describing uh, research data, which it took us about 18 months. Uh, and I, must admit, I was worried once we'd done it. I think it was a great piece of work and I was worried, how do we keep this current and how do we keep it active? And the Research Data Alliance was an ideal vehicle for doing that because many other people around the world recognised the value of it uh, and said, okay, how can we all collaborate to make it better? because we hadn't covered every single standard we should have done, and also to make it easier to maintain, to make it easier for many people to contribute to it as opposed to just us maintaining it. Uh, and that's an ideal example to me of a, where you can begin something in one country, it's a value to other people, and you then find a way to hand it on to a, to a global organisation to do it. So coming back to areas of activity, parts of what we do is focus on developing resources like that, pieces of, of well-structured information that help researchers or that help people like librarians and IT staff in universities that need to assist the researchers, things that help them achieve specific aims. So we produce written guidance uh, on things like how do you choose which bits of data to keep for the long term, given that in, in, in most research activities you'll generate lots of different versions of the same data set. You don't wanna, we can't afford to keep them all. So we do need to make intelligent choices and we need to recognise that occasionally we'll throw away something that years later we'll wish we hadn't and, and that unfortunately is, is, is life. We produce training materials and we do training aimed at researchers and service providers uh, on lots of different aspects of data management and we also run some online services, uh, most notably one called DMP Online that helps people um, produce data management plans that are conformant with the requirements of different funders that recognize the best practice in different research disciplines and the tool also allows a particular university to customize the answers and the advice that's given to suit the services that are available in that university. So it might recommend some researchers for instance um, answer particular questions with reference to uh, a storage facility or a repository that's in that university. And that way different researchers using the same tool will see different bits of guidance and different suggested answers to the same set of questions. So we hope that uh, that's something that helps people with that planning process. It doesn't write the plans for them, but it makes that task uh, somewhat easier than it might be. Uh, and our other activities are more directed around uh, policy, and helping national and international bodies understand what are the best next steps to take uh, in, in, in open data policy and also helping us understand that national picture of capability. We want to understand, for instance, in the UK, which aspects of open data are universities struggling with? 
if, if money is tight, where should we focus spending that money? Where are the real barriers that we need to put some extra investment in to help things along? Uh, conversely, there are some other areas of this where people are saying, OK, you've told us to do something that's straightforward, we'll do it, and we don't need any more help. There are many reasons why scientists refrain from opening their data. For instance, they may um, insist that data sharing is to a certain extent counterproductive for they spend a lot of time collecting their data and then someone wants them to open it and to open it to the public. Mm -hmm. And it's like, an, it's, it's like a ripoff. Uh, what benefits of data sharing could help convince researchers to open their data without this feeling of being ripped off? Convince people that, that that's a big uh, <coughs> request. So I think there's, there's a cultural change that's necessary in some areas of research that may take a generation to, to take effect. I can think of evidence that helps counter some of those arguments, but some of the emotional fear of being ripped off is um, evidence alone doesn't help deal with, with, with fears like that. You, you, you need to see culture change around you. One of the most compelling pieces of evidence, I think, because it shows how change can take place, comes from a field like astronomy, where Sharing has become the norm, partly as a consequence of the change in technology that happens in astronomy. When I began my research career, most astronomy wasn't digital. It involved photographic film, photographic plates being placed uh, behind telescopes. So you had this very physical resource, which was your research data, in a sense, your research output. And it was quite difficult to share. And as a result, most astronomy was, was done by people looking at their own observations. You know, I get time in a telescope, I take some pictures, I take them away with me, I look at them, my, my colleagues look at them, and, and then we write a paper based on what we found. And later on, perhaps we write another paper based on, you, you know how this goes. And although if somebody asked to see our observations, to share the, those we probably would have been willing to do it once we published the first paper. It wasn't easy and therefore those requests weren't common. Very little astronomical research was produced based on observations of anybody other than the author. Things like the Hubble Space Telescope and, and changes in telescopes more generally changed this. Suddenly telescopes were now using digital sensors and producing digital data. So sharing becomes simple then. The data is in a repository, anybody can access it. And the people behind those instruments decided that they would enforce this. Users of the HST have six, again, they still use the telescope in the same way. They choose to make the observations, they get some time. The data is then made available to them exclusively for six months. And after six months, whether or not they've published, that data is open to anyone. Everyone knows this, and I'm sure at the beginning there were many people who said, but yeah, I'll be ripped off on other people. But actually, astronomy doesn't seem to have suffered. In fact, astronomy now, in less than 10 years, the amount of papers that have been, are now being published based on other people's observations is greater than the amount of papers being published based on original observations. And yet, there are more telescopes and more observations than, than, than ever before. Every astronomer has the opportunity to access these, these much larger data collections. And it's enabling astronomy to be done in a different way. It's enabling automated mechanisms to analyze very, very large collections of images. And, and the driver is there to do that because astronomy is open. And you don't hear astronomers complaining anymore about them being ripped off. This is in one generation there's been a change of culture and, and in the middle there was fear about this and now everyone actually realizes the science is better and nobody's career has been harmed as, as a result of this. So I think if you can see that change happening in one discipline partly driven just by a, a technological change in, in, in how we measure observations then there's I think hope in, in, in many other areas as well and, and in some disciplines like the humanities where it's been the norm often for one individual, their life's work to be based on working on a particular collection that they control. That cultural change may be harder and more difficult to accept and slower to come, but, but I think it can 
it can still come. Um, and in terms of the benefits, the ones we can point to in astronomy, the, the ability to get credit, not just for the paper you write about your discovery, but the paper you write about, about your data itself, about the, the scholarly effort you put into to collecting data. Those are all benefits that, that apply across the disciplines. And if we were to uh, discuss the economic benefits of open data, what would you say? What is the most important result of uh, data sharing? Uh, reducing research repetition, better verification of ex experimental research results? The, 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 the economic benefits really um, straightforward. I think we, we, by openly sharing data, we can end up doing better research and uh, we get closer to the truth because we have more data that generally anybody in any discipline but I say I've only had a bit more time usually gather a bit more information then then I would do better research well you have access to, to large quantities that we can do that we can research becomes quicker the progress we make becomes quicker because we have access to, to larger amounts of, of, of data and the cost of research goes down so either for the same amount of money we can do more research more quickly or if the amount of money is shrinking we can still achieve the same results that we would have achieved um, before. Uh, th there's lots of um, studies, let's say, on the value of disciplinary data centers that show that the return on investment or the cost of running those centers is somewhere between four and 12 times the, the, the cost of running them. We get that again because research can be done more quickly and the value of that research to, to society in terms of end economic benefits is, is very, very great, particularly when you've got people working with the highly curated, very high quality data that ends up in most disciplinary data centers. Better research will be done uh, on the back of that. So we've got that evidence of, of a benefit there. There are other benefits that are harder to put an economic value on, but there's no question that we value them. And, and one of them is around research integrity. Uh, there are Almost every case one can look at from the past of, of fraud in research or error in research would have been caught much earlier if there had been access to the data that underlies the research. So examples from a couple of years ago of studies on chemotherapy in, in, in cancer, which many researchers were dubious about. A number of people wanted to look into the, uh, the claims made in the original research, but they found barrier after barrier in attempting to access the data behind it. Until they could get to that data, they, they could be suspicious about the claims, but they couldn't really demonstrate their suspicions. It took years to get at it, and once that data was available, immediately it was clear that these were utterly fraudulent claims. People and human beings you know, had suffered as a result of that. People had been given unnecessary treatments, perhaps even treatments that harmed them. And, and I'm not going to try and put a value on that, but it's clear that we want to avoid that. And, and there are all other areas, many other areas of, of, of scientific malpractice, which can all have been shown one way or another to, to, to rest on people being able to hide the data away and to rely on the fact that nobody really expected to, them to make it available. So I think that, that creating Whereas if you know there's a possibility that somebody could ask for your data, you're much, le much less likely to take that very dangerous step of, of publishing fraudulent claims. Dr. Ashley, in my final question, I would like to ask you about Poland. Uh, the European Commission recommends member states to uh, implement some sort of policy on open access and open data. And Poland is currently working in this area. I would like to ask you what should we especially remember about when adopting the new law? So if I'm right in understanding what you're describing, I think this is a law that applies not just in research but to public data in general. So including the, the data that's generated by government just in the process of, of administering the, 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 the country. That's definitely one of those areas where it's possible to spend a lot of time and money doing that not very well. Uh, and I think it's good to look at examples um, 
from a few countries. I think uh, Greece and the UK I know uh, are, are both examples where it's begun in a very lightweight fashion, um, choosing not attempting to solve the whole problem at once, but choosing simple data sets where um, reuse is highly likely, um, where you don't need to put a lot of effort into making it available, into making it understandable. And reuse in those areas helps make the case for doing it in others where the case is less clear. And, and I think it also helps us understand the processes we need to apply lightweight processes to take internal administrative data and make it easily reusable externally. Uh, the, the other thing I, help it, I think it helps deal with is a, a tension that I know exists, continues to exist for, for research data, for, for government data, between the feeling that, oh, perhaps this data is worth money and we should protect it and sell it or exploit it or, or patent it, you know, do something with it that, that's going to enable us to earn money. Uh, as opposed to saying, well, let's just open it up and, and allow others to exploit it. There's a lot of evidence that shows that for society as a whole, the greater benefit comes when you, when you open the data up uh, and allow the widest exploitation. The economic value that's generated is greater. That probably means you know, the tax revenues are better. The, and if you look at you know, what's the gross domestic product looking like in a particular country, you're better off when you do that. There is the problem, of course, that the, in that case, the costs fall on the government. The benefit is likely to be seen somewhere else. The government benefits indirectly through those tax revenues. But it's harder to follow that accounting trail and demonstrate that you connect the money that's made over here with the costs that are incurred over there. But experience with, with, with data in some countries where governments had in the past followed a path of attempting to protect and license and sell data shows that, yes, you can make some money out of it, but not very much. It, it costs quite a lot of money just to administer the sale of that data. And it, it, it's difficult to point to a real economic benefit the, be, because there are so many barriers in the way of the exploitation. Uh, and if you make the data reasonably expensive, which you need to do in order to cover your costs, for somebody else to exploit it, they need to be highly confident that they've got a really good money-making idea before they pay you the large amount of money to, to license the data. All, all those things tend to be, to be barriers, and, and where we've seen shifts take place um, from one model to, to, to another, um, we nearly always see that the data gets far more reuse and, and, and the end benefits are, are greater. I think that's worth bearing in mind in Poland because those arguments about should we sell the data should be open it are bound to come up again and again as you get political shifts from one side to another every country has had, uh, had these issues. Dr. Ashley thank you very much for your time and for this interesting talk. Okay thank you.